Welcome to the Market Call Show, where we discuss what's happening in the markets and the impact on your investments. Tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Market Call Show. Today I have Eric Crittenden on the show. Eric, I have known um, about for a long, long time. He's been in the investment management industry for quite a while in various capacities, and I'm really happy to talk to him today. Uh, you may have, uh, remember I talked to Tom Basso recently on the show, and he is uh, very well acquainted with Tom and has known him for quite a while. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. Now, e Eric, you are a manager of the Standpoint Multi-Asset Institutional Fund, and um, I was very happy to see how you constructed that portfolio, and I don't know everything about it, um, but uh, I have a lot of questions about that. But before we dive into that, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your evolution because I've watched you uh, for quite a while, kind of, you know, in the background, I saw you at Blackstar, you were there for quite a while, then, uh, then Longboard, there was a, like a progression, um, and, and now, now Standpoint, and I know it's all related. Can you give me a little bit of sense about your progression in uh, the investment management world here? Well, sure, I can try. It's always the hardest part for me uh, to go back in time and think about, you know, what was happening back then. So I guess I'll go back to the college years. I was uh, pre-med in the early 90s. I bounced around a lot. Um, I was that annoying student in the front row, always asking questions, trying to get the subject matter to relate back to reality. Um, I, I noticed this many times that it was very different from the other students. I was I annoyed them and I slowed the class down. I was always trying to get some sort of a conduit to reality to reconcile what I was learning and to, to see if it was practical. And that word practical keeps coming up over and over throughout my timeline is does this have practical value? So didn't last long, maybe two years uh, studying pre-med, went to public health, meteorology, um, flirted with computer science, economics. I mean, I was in college for nine years before I got my bachelor's degree. So in some ways I'm a failure, uh, but I felt like I learned a lot uh, and ultimately graduated with a degree in finance, uh, but with a strong uh, interest and emphasis on kind of uh, computerized finance. That's a, I kind of cobbled together a computational finance degree way back before that degree was a thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, right out of college, I went to work for a family office. Um, I learned a lot working at a family office. I saw people make tremendous sums of money, lose tremendous sums of money. Uh, and I feel like I learned a lot about behavioral finance and how it's pervasive mm -hmm. and it transcends cultures, continents, decades. Uh, there's just a lot of benefit that one can experience if they get emotion out of the investing process. So that's kind of led me towards systematic investing. Uh, ultimately, I left the family office after a few years. Uh, I was tired of dodging tornadoes in the Midwest. I grew up in Kansas. Uh, and I moved out to sunny Arizona. I uh, got a job here working on a trade desk for a local hedge fund. Uh, eventually spun out and started uh, Black Star Funds with a partner back then, which was kind of a fund of funds in a sense. We allocated out to a systematic global trend following managers but we manage the equity portion internally. Mm. So I would say my uh, original discipline was long, short equity, systematic, but long, short equity. And then over time realized that uh, we had the, the, I guess, talent and skills to build our own um, futures program, to stop paying hedge fund fees to other external managers, uh, co-founded Longboard Asset Management in 2010, I believe, 2000, you know, late 2010, um, launched mutual funds. Uh, we offered managed accounts. Uh, we had an LP, a uh, multi-strategy LP. Um, so I, I've got some experience uh, in different areas of, of the hedge fund industry and then the mutual fund industry. And then ultimately uh, started Standpoint uh, a little over three years ago uh, and decided to launch the the program that I want to uh, retire upon, uh, which mm. is our, our, we call it, you know, all weather, multi-asset, uh, it's just, I, I think it's the, uh, it's it's all our best ideas rolled into one program and it's exactly how I want my money invested. And we thought maybe the marketplace will like kind of an all weather total portfolio solution that we believe in. Uh, and it's certainly easy for us to run because I would be doing it with my own money anyway. So offering it 
to other investors, which is kind of the natural end game for us. So I want to ask you a question. Did you find that part of the challenges in, in building the business was regulatory constraints? Uh, because, you know, you're, 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 you're coming from a, a viewpoint that is more traditionally involved with hedge funds, where you're CFTC regulated as well as SEC regulated. There's, there's, there, it's a different mindset in the world of, of futures than it is in the world of securities. And um, if you've been, some people stay in one world or the other, very few cross pollinate across both. You and I both have done that, which, which I feel immediately a simpatico with you because of that. I don't even know you hardly, but I know of you and know some of the work that you've done. I've read some of the papers you've done, but it, it takes a different way of thinking to be able to go across those two lines. And my question is, is did you find as you were, you know, going more towards entrepreneurial endeavors that you had more issues with regard to regulations to get what you wanted out there? I'll tell you, um, that concept resonates with me and not too many people. Uh, I don't talk about that with too many people, but it was a big barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks scary at first, right? You have these two disparate worlds where they're using a different dictionary, a different glossary. You know, just the word alpha means something completely different in you know the hedge fund futures world than it does in the securities world. So at first it, it seemed like a daunting thing and you know no one's going to write a book about it. There's no user's manual. The regulators won't help you. They don't even talk to each other, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the CFTC and the NFA on one side, SEC and FINRA on the other. Um so you have to navigate this stuff yourself. Now, in the end, it's not very complicated. You know, mm -hmm. you just have to speak two languages. You got to speak French and German, right? Or whatever. Right. Um <laughs> and then over time they've harmonized the rules and the two things actually fit together nicely. If you use a little of both, uh, it fits into the current regulatory environment quite nicely. And that was a big surprise and something I, I'm appreciative of is just how well, if you do a good job of blending, you know, global futures with global equities and securities and futures and throw some T-bills in there, uh, it fits quite nicely into the current regulatory environment, but you kind of have to create your own user's manual. No one's going to do it for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to structure things in a certain way to get the the product out to people and to scale it is difficult if you have a, a single fund it's easy to do you know a single fund that's private right yes uh but but if you want to give it uh, get it out to the retail investor there's more challenges yeah and it used to be uh, a lot more challenging say 10 years ago when people first started doing this or 12 years ago um it was fragile you know, because in order to get commodities into, a, you know, a 40 act mutual fund, you had to jump through some hoops. Uh, like I mentioned previous, though, a lot of that's been harmonized and mm. it works very nicely. It's not a fragile arrangement anymore. It's actually quite durable, um, but nobody would do the work for you. You had to go out there and ask questions and pay lawyers and bang around and try stuff out. Uh, and you want to do that with your own money, right? You can't do that with other people's money in a mutual fund structure. So the the lead time for setting up an alts fund like this is quite a bit longer and more expensive, but it's very rewarding once you get it all set up. And like I said, I've been very pleasantly surprised at how durable uh, it works. I mean, in terms of, you know, satisfying all the regulators. Yeah. And, and what you're doing has always been what I believe should be done. So going back, uh, you know, just the data showed it, right? Because you're, the trend following oriented futures are so non-correlated to the equity markets and they tend to work really well. That strategy tends to work really well when, when you have rocky patches in the equity market. And when you put them together, it, it just makes a lot of sense. It's really kind of always been that way. And there's been macro fund managers that have done that for years, right? And it's always been only for the rich, right? It's always been... If you, if you had a million dollars plus to, to allocate just in that, then, you know, you could probably get it in the, in more like 5 million or 10 million, really. Um, and now we're able to, you're able to deliver this to uh, retail investors. Also, uh, registered investment advisors and brokers, they don't really understand the futures world. And whenever, yeah. whenever, they, whenever they look at uh, individual futures funds, which the stuff that they see is really not truly what it is because that they're constrained in some way. Usually historically they have been constrained in terms of the amount of leverage, you know, things like that. Uh, they see something that's not doing anything for a while and the market's skyrocketing and then they get pressure from their, 
their clients to what do we have this for? And, you know, and, and you've kind of solved for that because you've added some equity beta to the solution, but you still have that diversification coming from the, the managed futures. I even yeah, so I hate that term managed futures, but basically yeah, trend following non-correlated futures contracts long short. Yeah, managed futures doesn't mean anything, does it? Doesn't convey any information. Uh, so there's two important concepts you brought up there. Uh, one is that the math, the data, the empirical observation has for you know six decades said the same thing that if you diversify into global trends, into um, you know uh, grains, metals, energy, currencies, bonds, you know livestock, these things are independent and completely different than the stock market. So if you can source positive returns that are unrelated to stocks and bonds, and you can do that globally, all that diversification makes a really big difference to your experience and your path traveled. So I remember doing a project in college, actually, I think it was 1996, where uh, we were given the task of implementing modern portfolio theory by hand. You know, We had to write the code ourselves. I think it was Fortran or maybe Pascal back then. Mm -hmm. um, and go out and collect data and build, you know, the optimal portfolio. That was uh, one of the projects in the class. And I took that kind of to the extreme. You know, I had friends that had Bloomberg terminals, uh, commodity traders, grain traders back in Kansas. Um, so I collected all this data on all these different styles and strategies going back to 1970. Um, and I didn't know anything. So I was completely unbiased. I just collected all the data, cleaned it, got it into a total return format, put it into an optimizer, wrote the code. And it came back and it basically said, well, the optimal portfolio is about 50% into global trend and about 50% into global equities. Um, and it wanted to throw a little bit of corporate bonds in there, a little bit. Of, I don't know what, it wasn't tips. It was uh, MLPs. Uh, but mainly it was just, you know, if you could, the two principal components were global equities is one piston. Global trend on all the commodities is another piston. And that created the optimal sharp ratio portfolio, optimal Sortino, and it had the highest compounded annual growth rate. Uh, and the time frame was like 1970 to 1995, I think was the time frame I evaluated. Well, I did that same project. I resurrected that project back in 2018, uh, re-ran it um, and got the exact same weightings. And I looked at the performance of that kind of a blended portfolio from 1995 to 2019. And it was the stuff dreams are made. I just looked fantastic, right? So the optimal portfolio has not meaningfully changed since then. So that begs the question, why does no one do it? That's kind of what you're getting at is like, well, it's the, the math is the math. The diversification's there. It's been obvious for decades, but nobody does it. And I think it has a lot to do with the two things you've brought up. One that, the, you know, the futures world has been kept separate from the securities world. Uh, and the other one is the, what you just brought up with respect to adding something different from stocks and bonds into the portfolio, call it managed futures, global trend falling, whatever you want to call it, creates a new psychological challenge for advisors because it's uncorrelated, which means sometimes it's going to be down when the stock market's up. And most retail investors automatically view that as some sort of a mistake. They look at it like a report card and they say, everything should be, you know, B, A, C's are not the end of the world. But anytime you're down when the market's up, that's, that's clear evidence that, that there's some sort of a problem. They don't understand how non-correlation uh, works and that that represents diversification. So, but if you wrap it all up into one portfolio, then they get the benefit of that diversification without having to see the individual assets, you know, kind of going against each other from time to time. And that removes a lot of the psychological trauma that people experience when they stare at their portfolios, you know, every month or every week or every day. And some of these global hedge funds or macro, uh, global macro hedge funds have been doing that for a long time. And uh, investors have been seeing that result, not really understanding what they were really getting was trend following with stock selection. Now, a lot of those managers did a lot, you know, did a lot of different things too alongside of that and talked a different story. And there was usually some kind of a story surrounding why they were in trends. But if you actually broke it down, they were, you know, you could systematically get involved with trends in very similar fashion than having some story saying inflation is rising and bonds are down, we're short or whatever. We can come up, we can go back and fill in the fundamental story narrative, the gap, right? And I think a lot of these managers have been doing that in global macro for years. But, you know, behind the scenes, when I talk to these people that are doing it, they're, they're, they're looking at the same things you and I are looking at, 
They're looking at quantitative trend following as an it's, input into, I mean, yes, they're looking at all this fundamental stuff, but without that uh, a confirmation of the quantitative trend, they usually don't take big, as big as positions. So it's interesting to me, what you're doing is kind of like what hedge funds, global macro hedge funds have been doing for years. Yeah, it's very similar. Uh, another two, two points you just made that I'd like to unpack and elaborate on a little bit. Um, it's very common uh, to see the narrative, you know, communicated to you after the move. Uh, it's easy, right, to fill it in and say, well, the Fed went too far or, the, you know, the Treasury's, you know, in there buying bonds. It's, it's very easy after the fact um, to craft the narrative to fit what happened. Uh, doing it ahead of time is extremely difficult and doesn't really work. Uh, and what you'll find, and people don't like to talk about this, but off the record, if you talk to people in the industry, <laughs> they will admit that you know 80 to 90% of their returns come from the plain vanilla old school models they've been using for decades. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't make for good marketing. Correct. So they spend, <laughs> it's a Pareto principle. So 80% of the returns you know, come from the old school, simple stuff that hasn't changed. There's a reason. There's a risk premium there. Uh, and if you want to collect it, you have to you have to participate in a certain way, which psychologically is not a lot of fun, but it works. Um, but you're going to spend 80% of your marketing talking about stuff that's much more exciting and seems new. Um, you know, artificial intelligence, genetic algorithms, neural networks, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's very easy to take an elite hedge funds track record and reverse engineer it and essentially uh, say, well, there's maybe four or five risk premium in the world. You got the equity market risk premium, you know, you've got your corporate bonds, uh, you've got real estate, you've got trend, whatever. And then basically just combine them and iterate through all the different, you know, weightings and combinations to basically recreate that track record. It's not that difficult. Uh, and even some of the best managers out there, it's not hard to weight these different risk premium in such a way that you're getting almost the same track record. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me, and it's not proof, it's circumstantial, but it tells me that it, it, it's not impossible. It's not magical. Um, now, there are some people, in particular market makers, that have uh, some sort of a structural advantage that we can't recre recreate. Right. So that's a risk premium that's just not available unless you're willing to pay the hundreds of millions of dollars to get into the, right. the infrastructure, you know, co-locate your servers at the exchange and do what they do. So they have pole position and you can't displace them from that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, it's not that much. It's meaningful. I'd like to have it, but I can't. So, but I can do all the other stuff correctly. So that that's our philosophy. That's what we're trying to do. Mm. Very interesting. Well, I, 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 I commend you for p packaging it the way you have. I think it's a, it's a good way to go. Um, uh, it, it, especially if you're introducing it to the retail market, because they, I think a lot of advisors need that. They need that equity component in there to stay on the bus. Well, and that also helps. It also helps. Um, I, I get this question a lot like, okay, so you added some equity beta into a global trend program to kind of smooth the experience for people. Um, but we, we have done the research, you know, left to right and right to left. And a couple of my coworkers here at Standpoint years ago challenged me because I wanted to do, you know, pure global macro trend. And um, they, they, uh, they intervened <laughs> and they sat me down one day and they said, Eric, what if you did the opposite of the research project you did before? Instead of trying to find the best diversifier to a 60-40 portfolio or the best diversifier to a stock portfolio, Take it as whatever it is you love that you've committed your your, your research to, um, and then go out and compare all the asset classes in the world, clean total return, net of fees, um, tax-adjusted returns, and find the best diversifier to what you do and tell me why you wouldn't add that in. So I thought, okay, that that's actually a very interesting project. So I did it, and it took a long time. You know, It was a six-month data project because I wanted to collect data on every single global asset class that was investable and reasonably scalable that I possibly could. Um, and I have a bias and I'll tell you, I will talk about my bias. Well, maybe we'll get to it, but sure. uh, I have a bias towards complexity uh, and that if it's scarce, it must be valuable. turns out that's not exactly true, but uh, so mm. I have to be aware of that bias. 
So I did all this analysis and, and I anonymized the asset classes to keep my opinion out of it, right? So I just labeled, gave them all unique identifier, ran the analysis, and it came back and two asset classes stood out from the, from the pack of dozens and dozens of asset classes as being great diversifiers to what it is I like to do, which is you know systematic global trend. So I revealed them. The first one was global corporate bonds. Global corporate bonds had the lowest correlation and added the most value when they were blended in with global macro trend, right? In second place, by just like two basis points, literally it was a tie for first place, uh, was simple global market cap weighted equity. And I thought, wow, that is really demoralizing because that's, <laughs> it's the, because I had, I had all my long short stuff in there too. Long short equity, uh, rotation, momentum, all these different styles, but just simple market cap weighted, tax efficient, low fee global equity beta blended much better with the macro trend than pretty much anything else. So then I decided to adjust for scalability uh, and ability to trade. You know, if you want to offer da people daily liquidity in a plain vanilla mutual fund, your underlying assets need, you need to be able to get in and out of them if necessary. So that ruled out corporate bonds. And then by those metrics, you know, global market cap weighted equity was by far the optimal solution. So I went back to my team and said, well, it's as simple as, like you said, adding in the equity beta, but that's the reason that we added in the equity beta because by adding it in, you lifted the compounded return. You squashed the drawdowns and the volatility came way down. So yeah. you can take two relatively risky things, but if they are if they work together well as a team by offsetting each other when you need it the most, you get something that's a lot less risky than either one of the individual components. Did it's you? just modern portfolio theory, but taken to its natural conclusion where you go source the diversification you need instead of just relying on stocks and bonds. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. Did you include equity futures in your global trend? Yes. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because sometimes it'll be short. Yes. Uh, and uh, depends on it, it depends on how much you're allocating to that segment. Typically, trend followers will have four major segments, equities, fixed interest rates, commodities, and currencies, mm -hmm. um, typically. Uh, and then sub subcategories sub underneath them. Um, um, but there's correlations between um, the currencies. And the, there's a lot of little structures, correlation structures between the segments there. Um, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. I'm surprised that you came up with corporate bonds because there's an element you must have been using uh, uh, like 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 single A uh, or or you probably weren't using like it had, you had to have been using something that was really high investment grade there because it would correlate closer to T bills. If you were using something that was lower, it would be correlating more to equities, which would have po popped it out of the your your equation. I'm just guessing. <laughs> uh, it's so funny because I have done this kind of analysis for years. And it's so cool to see you turning it into reality, into a, a product that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, uh, you know, and we're getting a little bit technical. Some of our listeners, listeners don't are not as technical as you and I <laughs> may be. Uh, and that's okay, because we want to we go ahead and um, uh, we don't want to dumb anything down on the podcast. It's okay for us to talk as technical as we need to. Um, I, I remember you were doing a lot of stuff in individual stocks. And now you're doing a lot of ETFs. And um, I, I'm curious about your evolution and what your thought process was with individual stock selection versus the ETFs. D is it because it's, it's harder to generate the results, it's more complex, there's more tax issues, uh, that it just made it less feasible to do individual equities versus ETFs? Or what is your what was your thought process from moving away from that and moving towards the ETS? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. My my bias was to go with the individual stocks. I always want uh, total control if possible. Um, so I, in order to source our equity exposure in our mutual fund, there were three realistic paths we could have gone down. We could have used futures to get that equity exposure. That's super simple and easy. There's a problem there, though, and that is you're creating taxable events every single time you roll the futures. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a bummer because I don't want people paying taxes when you can defer those taxes. So I ruled out futures. 
Um, the other one was the common stocks. Now I've run big portfolios with thousands of common stocks in there. I've done all the accounting, corporate actions, dividends, you know, and accounted for the survivorship bias, delistings. Like if you try to pull a chart of Enron or WorldCom right now, you won't, it'll get an error because they don't exist anymore, but you, you were trading them back then. I promise yeah. you. Um, so handling all that stuff was in my wheelhouse and I spent a considerable amount of years of my life studying how to account for survivorship bias and, and, you know, all the corporate action issues and stocks. So I thought, well, I'll put that to good use. So I did that analysis. Um, and it's fine. You, you can run a portfolio that way. Uh, but there's, there's some downsides to doing it that way. One, you're in a mutual fund, which means your administrator has to price every security in your mutual fund every day. So, and somebody has got to pay for all those thousands of hours of accounting work uh, and they have to deal with all the corporate actions and whatnot. So when you put 3000 common stocks in your mutual fund, uh, the shareholders are going to pay uh, for all the workload associated with doing that. So it needs to be meaningfully better than something simple like an ETF in order to justify adding all that complexity and workload in. So I took a look at the ETFs and the ETFs have their own issues. One, you have they charge fees. Common stocks don't charge fees. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the fees of these ETFs and I was I was surprised um, that the fees are as low as they are. I think some of these ETFs are down at three basis points. Others are at four and a few of them are at five and six. So I thought to myself, all right, well, is it worth it to pay on average, let's just say four basis points for the ETF exposure to get rid of the complexity of having thousands of common stocks I mean, which is going to be in the best interest of the shareholders long-term, paying that management fee or paying you know all the accounting costs for all those corporate actions and pricings. And then I learned something interesting. If you go inside of these ETFs, um, you know whether it's BlackRock, State Street, Schwab, or Vanguard, they are lending the shares out to short sellers and collecting short interest credit. Uh, and in most of the cases, all or you know 80 plus percent of the short interest they're collecting is going back into the ETF as performance. It's just another rev. It's, it's a revenue stream. Um, and I, so I did some back of the envelope math on that and realized that they're they're collecting you know anywhere from eight to twenty five basis points in short interest credit, and that's flowing through most of it. In some cases, all of it is flowing through to the owners of the ETF. So, are you really paying a fee? If you're paying three, the three basis point management fee, that's 003 percent. Uh, and you're getting, you know, 0.15% in short interest credit. It seems to me they're paying you to own the ETF in a sense. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, other than the impact costs and the bid, bid ask spread, which they have minimized, I, I think, yes, that's true. If you compare the performance of the, those ETFs relative to the index itself, total return, that's kind of a hypothetical thing that you really can't directly invest in. It's pretty darn close. Well, and, the ones I've looked at, they've actually slightly outperformed their benchmark and it and it's because of the short interest credit rebate and then you also have tax efficiency yes so in the end etfs won out for me um they're liquid um, you, you can trade in the secondary market but you can go to the primary market if need be that's what we did for tax loss harvesting this last year mm -hmm. so and the fees just they, they made sense uh and then the accounting is really simple you know we've got a etfs rather than you know 3500 global individual equities so i noticed that, that you have more than one in the same index is that for tax purposes for uh, uh using different different etfs that are like say in the s p 500 there's two reasons for that. One is the ability to tax loss harvest. So we have a stable of 16 ETFs and we'll hold an eight at any given time. And then we can swap back mm -hmm. to the other eight in an environment like last year where there were enormous tax loss harvesting opportunities. Uh, the other reason is it's a, it's a different company, maybe the same index, but it's a different it's a different ETF provider. Correct. So, and that's just diversifying across ETF providers. You never know when they're going to get bought out, and it's not True. impossible for 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 you know Vanguard or State Street or to have some sort of regulatory mm -hmm. situation. It's unlikely, but it's not impossible. So, I diversify when I can, when it doesn't cost me anything, and in that case, it's just diversifying across different providers. Yeah. So, so picking the individual stocks, you would have to be creating enough alpha to overcome all of those issues, <laughs> expenses, bid ask spread, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to do that in these and then keep it liquid uh, so that you can rebalance across, 
you know, more from an allocation per, asset allocation perspective. So those ETFs make a lot of sense. I could see why you did that. Um, yeah. Now, a question I had was, I know that in your fund, I'm kind of switching around and we can hop around wherever you'd like. Uh, you have a separate entity, I think a Cayman Island uh, entity. Uh, is that for the, just the managed future sex, se uh, segment of the portfolio or? So um, the answer is twofold. So in most alternative funds, when you see a Cayman entity, uh, what they're doing is they're putting all the futures in the Cayman entity and then they own the Cayman entity. So it's called a controlled foreign corporation, which is a, your, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the fund. So other people don't invest into it. It's just the fund itself. So um, in our case, anybody who trades commodities in a 40 act fund, whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund or whatever, if it's regulated by the investment act of 1940 commodities, you got to be careful because they don't create good income, right? So if you have more than 10% of your returns come from commodities, you, you get into this kind of regulatory gray area where is, is it a, a RIC, a registered investment company, or is it a corporation? Mm -hmm. So you don't want that because now you got to fight with the IRS over double taxation issues. So what everyone's done for, it's almost 40 years now, I think PIMCO pioneered this, is in order to convert that any commodity income from the bad income category into good income, you have to do it inside of an equity vehicle. So, and the only way to do that safely is you control the equity vehicle. So essentially what you do is you create a, a subsidiary and you mm -hmm. domicile it in the Cayman Islands. The money never leaves the U.S. It's it's, it's in the bank account, you know, from mm -hmm. the fund at a, at a U.S. bank. Um, you're just using Cayman law for this, this offshore entity. Um, it is the one that trades the commodity futures. And then the way you get the profits to come back is via a dividend. So you essentially create a subsidiary, you're managing it, you do all your commodity trading there. And then at the end of the year, the profits come back as a dividend. And that dividend is considered an equity dividend because it's an equity vehicle that washes the income and it becomes good income. So that's how everyone that I've ever seen gets commodity exposure into a mutual fund uh, without creating a whole bunch of extra regulatory hurdles. So that's the reason for the Cayman entity. However, some people don't use the Cayman entity as intelligently as they should, in my opinion. They do all the futures trading through the Cayman entity. You don't need to do that. You just need to do the commodity futures through the Cayman entity. You can do currency and equity futures and bond futures domestically, and you get better tax treatment if you do so. So knowing these things and understanding how the rules actually work put you in a good position to structure your fund more intelligently. Um, such that the tax burden on the on the investors is lower, so that's what because you get a, so. you get a split between uh, capital gain and 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 uh, income tax rates if it's if it's the futures directly exactly the dividend yeah. the dividend is taxed at a at, a, at another rate ordinary typ income typically the ordinary income rate which they've changed around <laughs> quite a bit but that's that's really uh, that that makes a lot of sense I, the reason why I brought it up is because I think a lot of investors don't understand. You know why you do something like that it's really important to understand why you would do that it's important it, it helps investors to do it that way it's not something that is uh you know unusual or something like that very interesting um i want to talk a little bit i was on your website and i was just kind of uh just looking at what you had on there and i, I noticed you did this analysis where you ran a, like a monte carlo simulation of the bond market you said okay here's the here's the bond market and let's let's uh let's run some some simulations what kind of total returns would we get in bonds over the next i forget if it was five or ten years and the returns across all of these different scenarios was so dismal um maybe you could speak a little bit to why somebody needs alternatives when you look at that bond market and probably you're not going to get a whole lot of return over the next 10 years or five years whatever you know, yeah, you, so the, yeah. the video you're referring to, I think that was August of 2020, you know, so I was locked down like everyone else, bored out of my mind. <laughs> um, and I had all my cl people, clients, talking to them on the phone, Zoom meetings, and, you know, everyone's cramming their money into bonds. And I'm looking at the bond market and the math, and I'm thinking to myself, why would anybody in their right mind be enthusiastic about bonds? I mean, the yields yeah. are essentially zero, negative in some cases, and uh, inflation was, I don't know, I don't know what it was. It, inflation is a very subjective thing in my opinion. So 
some people insisted inflation was four. Other people said it was negative, CPI, this, that, the other thing, whatever. The bottom line <laughs> is um, there was almost no conceivable way for you to make a positive return on bonds, at least in the next you know couple of years, given where the rates were. Um, and so I, I'm not a bond guy. You know, I, I don't like bonds, <laughs> uh, but the math is pretty simple. Uh, so I just decided to set up that Monte Carlo simulation and take, you know, all the historical bond data and then Im impose the structure of bonds. You know, I mean, there's only two ways you're going to make money, your interest payment and any potential capital gain, capital gain going forward. Uh, if you're getting capital gains, that necessarily means that the rates are going down. If the rates are already at zero, how much lower can they realistically go? I mean, they can go negative, but I just did the math. And, and the question I had was, how negative do rates have to go in order for people to get the returns from bonds that they're expecting? Everyone was expecting a 6 7% return from the 10-year. So I did the math, and it's it's kind of a quadratic um, – it's, there's a non-deterministic component to it. So you, I ran a Monte Carlo simulation with all the different paths traveled. I think there were 3,000 scenarios. And only one out of 3,000 came up with a positive real return, You know, <laughs> assuming a very modest inflation. I think it was maybe one and a half or 2%, something like that. So, And then I also calculated that the, the yield on the 10-year needed to go to negative six in order for you to get the return on bonds that you're expecting to get over the next, I believe it was five years. So, And I remember saying on some podcasts back then, if the 10-year if the yield goes to negative six, your portfolios are going to be the least of your problems. I mean, yes. it's going to be absolute mayhem and chaos, like a yeah. sci-fi movie. So I do not know what you're doing investing in bonds. Um and I got a lot of hate mail from that. <laughs> nobody and <laughs> nobody appreciated it at the time. Um, and, but then when bonds did what they did um, over the next year and a half or two years or whatever, some people have come around and said, well, that was actually pretty insightful. But it didn't do me any favors at the time, that's for sure. Yeah, and yeah that's really interesting that you you went through that that analysis. And it, it, it was so obvious, right? And it's like, how long... The question is, is when, when does it actually change? When does that trend change? And the beautiful thing about, I want to get a little bit into your strategy, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the beautiful thing about using more of a quantitative trend approach is that you're really not trying to predict, you're actually saying what you're going with the flow. Can you explain to me a little bit about, or explain to the audience a little bit about how you you know, do analyze trends, what, what, what time frames you're looking at, and and how just a just a general philosophy and how the trend part works. Sure. So um trend. You know, so some of these words I, I I wish they were different. You know, quant, trend, leverage, these are all scary words, but it's it's really simple. Um, we don't want to be on the wrong side of big multi-year trends. That's that's what screws everyone up, right? It's like you own tech stocks in the year 2000, you didn't do anything about it, and you went down 80%. You owned Bitcoin at wherever it was, 60, 70,000. You wrote it all the way down. Um, every decade has its wipeout. Some sector or some total economy, and sometimes it's the whole market, just goes down 40, 50, then 60, and sometimes more than that. Um, not being on the wrong side of those things is really helpful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I wish that I could go back in time and change some of these terms because the, the word trend has these negative connotations uh, it sounds kind of silly, right? Um, you know, what do you learn? Buy low and s sell high. Don't buy high and don't sell low, but that's what these trend followers are actually doing is you buy high so you can sell higher and you short sell low so you can buy to cover even lower. Uh, and it's because markets actually, if you look at the empirical data, markets have a tendency to at times trend a lot more than you intuitively ever would. I mean, who saw the bond market sell off coming? You know, mm -hmm. Who saw energy prices going negative in 2020? Um, markets not just overshoot, they do that to clear the market, to bring buyers and sellers together to settle these supply-demand imbalances. So trend followers are just simply determined to not be on the wrong side of those trends and to try to be on the right side of some of them. And over time, that compounds wealth, and it happens to be uncorrelated with what you're typically doing, which is stock and bond portfolio. So it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so you asked the question, uh, it it's important to diversify your trend models too, because sometimes short-term trend following is very profitable for three, five, seven years. Other times, medium-term trend following is where all the profits are, and other times, really long-term trend following. I'll share with you this. Um, 
I have another bias towards, I don't like trading frequently. I like keeping transaction costs low. I'm a patient and disciplined person and I don't seek excitement and I don't wake up wanting to trade. I never have and I never will. So my bias is towards the longer term models and long term over, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, I'm convinced that they work better. If work better means higher compounded returns with lower experienced risk. Um, however, the short-term models add a lot of value at certain points in time, and they should be included because the long and medium-term models can go out of favor for four, five, seven years, and that drives clients insane. Case in point, when we launched Standpoint, I integrated short-term, medium-term, and long-term models in there to give people, or at least to attempt to give people a much smoother ride and a more diversified across trends through time. Since we launched, the short-term models have been lights out, just compounding at very high rates of return. The models that I prefer, medium and long-term, have not done nearly as well. So when markets are really fast, COVID style, and you get these, uh, these uh, maddening, quick, painful moves, the short-term models really pay off. So I think of them almost as like a form of insurance mm -hmm. where they may have a lower expected return long-term, but they add a tremendous amount of value in other ways. Yeah. They're, they're so, also the lowest correlated, I believe, to the equity market because they'll tend to go short beforehand. Um, if I remember correctly, that's kind of what I've, I've noticed. Um, so you do, so you have multi time frame. Do you do you um, have them in allocated buckets, or do you, um, you know, do you risk budget to all three and then overweight the longer, intermediate, and longer term, or how is your overall thinking? I know you don't want to give the whole secret sauce, but what is your overall thinking on how you construct that? So my philosophy there is, unless the complexity can show me added benefit, um, I'm not going to do it. Because when I look at the winners in this space, if you don't listen to what they say and look at what they do, it's because they kept things simple and they stayed disciplined and they executed their plan. Now, their marketing and all that other stuff will have all kinds of bells and whistles and whatnot. But if you look at what they do, um, it's usually the same thing over and over. If you look at the people that don't survive in the industry uh, and you talk to them and find out what happened and talk to people that used to work there and look at what they do. It's usually some fragility that they weren't aware of that was the source of this perceived alpha, but later became, you know, the iceberg that they crashed into. Mm -hmm. um, so there are winners and losers in this industry. And the, the common denominator among the winners is they stick with durable, simple things and have realistic expectations the, the common denominator that I see amongst the losers is too many moving parts, fragility that they didn't understand, um, and then their sequence came and they didn't have an answer for it and they lost enough money uh, such that their investors gave up on them. Now, it may have come back. In a lot of cases, I think the, the their programs came back. But they didn't have any assets anymore, so they ended up shutting down or rolling up into something else. So um, – so I'm telling you that my bias, and I think I like this bias, I believe in this bias, is towards simplicity and durability uh, and don't get carried away. Uh, and it's hard for me, right? Because I'm a curious person um, and I, I, I continue, the concept of continuous improvement appeals to me, but so, so you should do the work, but you should be very, very wary about adding new features unless they increase the durability of what you're doing. And most of them just don't. They don't increase the durability. Too many moving parts creates fragility, and you know, God help the 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 <laughs> the system developer that doesn't understand and respect that. Yeah, that's the whole concept of robustness in your models. You know, models that were that can work across many different uh, scenarios, and that ultimately keep you out of trouble. You know, you're not. You know, if you have too many moving parts, you could really mess you up. Curve fitting, all of that. Um, I'm curious about when you when you say you um, you'd like to keep things simple. In the industry, you basically have two types of trend following, if you will, uh, management of positions after you take on a position. Um, I large the larger you get, the more you need to scale your positions in and out. Um, and but the question becomes: Do you vol target? Do you size in a way where you're constantly watching your vol, or do you let her rip? 
and then you just move your stops around. Not, I know you probably don't hold stops in the market, but your your uncle point where you're going to reverse a trend or or, or or exit either for a loss or for a profit. Do you vol target or do you let it run more like like a Jerry Parker would do, or or, or would you do more or do you do more like a vol sizing? That not initially vol sizing. I mean ongoing vol sizing. Yeah. So I've I've been the referee in that debate for 20 years in the industry. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've, I've agreed with Jerry Parker. I've argued with Jerry Parker and, and, and 15 other guys in the industry and, and refereed their arguments. And, um, you gotta be your own person, right? It's, uh, what I've found is that it's a trade-off, you know, if you go Jerry, Jerry's way, um, I feel like it's more durable, than having because Jerry's smart and he's not going to um, put unnecessary features into a program. I don't think. No, he's not going to do that. No. Um, but he has a tendency, you know, he he his bias is towards, you know, don't mess with it after you put it on. Right. I like that. Right. Um, but I also understand the counter argument, which is um, well, things change, right? If you were putting the trade on now, there you would do this size, not that size. So um, how can both of these be right? So it's kind of like, you know, Democrat versus Republican. There's these two camps. Um, <laughs> and it, I'm not saying that one's right and the other one's wrong. It's like, well, if, if I'm in the middle and I come over here, I get something for doing that, but I give something up. If I go the other way, well, I get something for doing that, but I give something else up. And these trade-offs, there's a wide zone of where the trade-offs are okay. You know, it's mostly just semantics. Uh, they don't, they're not material to the experience the investor is going to get. Um, so that, that it's kind of a judgment call. Where do you want to be? So in my case, what was really important to me is that I have something that's scalable such that if I'm fortunate enough to get to, you know, five or $6 billion in the program, that it's the exact same program that it was in March of 2020. Because I don't want to have to people to come back and redo their due diligence for mm -hmm. the fifth time. Because now that we're at three billion, there's no way that we could be doing what we were doing when we were at fifty million. Um, that is what most firms do. Um, I've lived that life before. It's not fun because no one's ever. The sales process is never closed. Mm. You know, it's not like an index fund where it's like, look, I own this thing. The track record from back then is relevant today. Um, that's just not the case for a lot of funds that change what they do because they got big. So we decided to launch a program that was already big. So the model already believes it has $12 billion in it. And we run it like it has $12 billion in it. And then we get this model portfolio and then we can just simply ratio it down to whatever our current asset base is, which right now is I think 550 million. So it's a small fund. Um, but we don't have to worry about capacity issues or changing the program or letting anyone know that we've run into capacity issues till we start approaching like $10 billion. So that's important. Now, when you do that though, you got to run it like it's a big program, which means you have to overweight the most liquid markets and underweight the less liquid markets. So if you look at the crude oil market, it's huge. And our crude oil position is going to be 20 times the highs, the size of our tiny heating oil position, which is a much smaller market. Gold's bigger than silver, corn's bigger than canola, so on and so forth. So if you think about it, we're running the equivalent of a market cap weighted futures program. Mm -hmm. So rather than an equal weighted. So, and a lot of people have passionate views on that. And they say, well, your yours is getting more concentrated. It's less diversified. Um, all those things are true. Um, but I have run the simulations going back to 1970 for every conceivable mixture you know, where it's beta neutral, equal risk contribution, you know, equal VAR contribution. Um, there aren't any meaningful differences, not by my opinion. So by taking away all the complexity and just running a simple market cap weighted program that has no capacity issues, had 10 basis points lower return and maybe 20 basis points higher volatility over the last 50 years. Um, and so I look at it and say, I'm not really giving that up because that's not real to me. What's real to me is what can I, what I can I in an intellectually honest manner offer people that's not going to change over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, you could find periods of time when maybe an equal contribution would do better than a market cap. 
uh, but it's not always going to be that way. I have a philosophy on why that's the case, and that's just simple, just mathematics of, you know, you have this whole pie, and when money moves, it's going to go from one to the other, and it's kind of naturally, uh, it's kind of naturally changing your weights to what would be what the average investor has, and it's, and, you know, the mathematics of that is hard to beat. I mean, it's just, uh, and and you're, there's going to be times where you you know okay you have more financial ex exposure and and you had a big move against you and it's not going to be like as good as the other guy who had more equal contribution or something like that. Um, but over the long run, that won't always be the case. The big thing is making sure that you have that mixture. The thing that moves the needle is the trend versus the equity. It's not the uh, you know the the various sectors. In my opinion, uh, in the short run, that's true. But um, sorry, I'm, I, I shouldn't be, uh, that's just, I'm telling you my own personal opinion, but I like what you're doing with that. But the question I had was more about vol sizing on an ongoing basis. Do you, I, I was, when I was talking to Tom, I said, you know, you know Tom, you were doing a, a, an, an element of vol sizing before everybody else was doing it. Not, I mean, on the ongoing basis, because most trend followers early on, they took their initial position, they let it run, they moved their stops. And if it was, if the contribution to daily returns was getting excessive, they didn't really do anything about it. Most traders back in the day, uh, you know, uh, Tom said, hey, that silver trade was brutal, you know, so let's put some caps, some some guardrails around how much daily contribution to the return we're going to allow. Do you do that or do you or, or do you just let her rip? We do have common sense caps implemented. They don't get okay. hit very often. Um, but I'll be on, I want to need to be a hundred percent honest. Most of that is, is regulatory in nature. I'm comfortable, uh, letting it rip. Uh, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference in my opinion though, but having common sense caps is more making the regulators happy. Um, I, so far it's been, we're in our fourth year now, uh, maybe one time when interest rates were really low. Some of the very short-term um, interest rate markets had super low volatility, and the subsequent position sizes were just astronomically high. <laughs> um, that would just those would be irresponsible to trades to put on. So that's the only one that's been hit recently. Um, I have them in there, and I, I look at I look at the portfolio every day, uh, so I'm aware of where exposures are, both in terms of risk, notional value, and value at risk, distance to stop as well. Um, and I'll, I will intervene uh, if necessary, um, but it's going to be, you know, I've got to satisfy regulators, uh, but I also have to satisfy ourselves. We have a certain risk appetite and we don't want to exceed that. And there are different ways to limit it, but I expect once every five years to have to intervene, maybe. Uh, and it's usually one market that's causing the issue. We had an issue with nickel. Um, I don't know if you're paying attention, but the nickel market went completely crazy a while back and it yeah. went up three, four hundred percent in a couple of days. And we were long. Uh, so we were making money. Um, but as we dug into the reality of that market, it was, you know, there was a it was a Chinese company with Russian ties mm -hmm. that owned nickel. They were short the forward contract in London. Um, but they didn't have the proper nickel to deliver. And then with the Ukraine situation, it was just turning into madness over there. Um, <laughs> so I had to make a decision. Do I want to defend this nickel position to the board and the regulators? It's halted. You know, it's it's up 100% one day. It's down 50 the next. Or do I just want to kick it out of the portfolio uh, because it's not worth it? It's no longer functioning as a, as a proper risk transfer market. That's where, you know, our risk premiums come from providing liquidity to hedgers. This market doesn't have, you know, a proper hedger speculator relationship right now. So I just calmly liquidated it at the first available opportunity, booked those profits, redlined the market and said, we're not going to trade this until they get their stuff figured out. So that would be an example of us intervening um, for regulatory reasons, but also it would appear to someone else that we're intervening based upon risk because it became a very, very risky position. That's another advantage to having more of a market cap focus because nickel's small. Yes. And if you have a small market, you have more potentiality to have these massive volatility gaps. And it, when you're in these bigger markets, can it happen? Sure, but it's not likely to happen as much. Very interesting. Okay, so I have like a zillion questions, but I'm just going uh, ad-libbing. Go for it. <laughs> I prefer the ad-lib because we're having a more real conversation. <laughs> um, Authenticity is, is the best. Yeah, you know, um, 
I was just thinking about your your parameter sets and all that stuff. You know, how when you're thinking about your your sizing and all of that, are you thinking about your overall let me rephrase the question. What is your overall risk target if you have one? Like like what kind of volatility do you anticipate overall over the long run it should average your fund? So we we view volatility as a symptom of risk. It's not risk itself. Risk is a very specific thing to me. Um, and this is just my philosophy. This is my glossary I'm sharing with you. Risk is how much am I going to lose if um, I'm wrong on all of the positions in our portfolio? So we have a 0% win rate, a 100% failure rate. That's never happened, but it'll happen someday. Mm -hmm. um, and they this go all the way to our stop losses and, and they hit and get triggered. And I send the blotters uh, to the brokers and say, liquidate all these positions. And I get out around my stop loss price. Uh, for us, that's 10%. Okay. So that's 10% of the total portfolio value. And that's that's just for the futures. Mm -hmm. ETFs don't have stop losses. So that's the number. Is okay. it the optimal number? No, it's, it's optimal number is probably like 30. Yeah, that's but a good no. number though, because it keeps your volatility number at, at 10. That's going to yeah, and and how many roughly how many futures positions do you hold? Fifty or our our universe is seventy five. So we've got anywhere from you know forty five to sixty five typically on at any given point in time. Okay, yeah. So you don't you don't have a position on always long and short. You have periods of time where you're flat. Sounds like yes. Okay. Yes. A big there's one argument could be uh, on the devil's advocate side is is well why would I want to pay for more, um, I guess, pay 1.24% or whatever the ratio is for equity beta. That's half, half the portfolio is equity beta. And I could just go buy that for six basis points. You know, okay. You know, that's one argument. Uh, have you, has anybody ever asked you that? I yeah. Mean, in, in the beginning, that's everybody basically pointed that out. And, um, my response actually was very welcomed uh, or maybe not at first, but everyone understood so I'll tell it, I'll tell it like it is. We run a macro program. So anybody who runs a macro program that uses futures will experience the following reality. Let's say you gave me $1 million and you said, Eric, go run your macro program. I like it. And I don't want the ETFs, just run your macro program. Out of that $1 million you give me, I only need $100,000 to run the whole macro program. Those are the margin deposits that mm -hmm. go to the futures brokers. What do I do with the other nine hundred thousand dollars? You buy T bills. Yeah, mostly. Yeah, that's or, what people or, do. Or you might, depending on who you are, you may do various things. Yeah, yeah you could do a laddered bond portfolio, commercial yeah. paper, T bills, whatever. But it's all basically, you know, one year duration and in fixed income. So that's what they all do. That's that's been the way it's been for the past forty years, right? So we deviate from that. So instead of putting nine hundred grand into T-bills or commercial paper or floaters or whatever, uh, we take about half of it and stuff it in ETFs. All right. So are you paying me 1.24 to stuff the money in the, into the ETFs? No, you're paying me 1.24 for to run this global macro trend program. Mm -hmm. But I take about half the idle capital that I otherwise would have stuffed into T-bills. And I put it into these ETFs because these ETFs are uncorrelated with the macro program and they add a lot of benefit and they take away the sting in bull markets when quote unquote trend or alts are underperforming. Yeah. And, and, and if you have an IRA account, you know, you could put that money in there uh, and then you have more capital efficiency than if you were to try to run, let's say you just open an account at IB mm -hmm. and you were going to run it yourself. There'd be capital limitations there for you. The capital efficiency argument is enormous, um, and without it, I don't, I wouldn't be very enthusiastic about the business. I'd still do it, but the capital efficiency that's afforded to us by structuring the fund a certain way is really eighty percent of the benefit, in my mm -hmm. opinion. But most people, they don't really understand it. Um, it doesn't. It's not a marketing topic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a market. It's a marketing topic for me. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm one of those geeky guys that it's a marketing topic for me. So, if if you have, uh, what is your leverage ratio? If you don't mind me asking, like how levered is the? Uh, if you were to take the total notional on on equity, what would it be roughly? Okay, so you're talking about economic leverage, not legal leverage, right? Right, right. Economic leverage. 
Yeah. So um, with or without short-term bonds, like would you include the T-bills and like the really short-term bonds? Yes. Okay. So your typical macro manager just running a macro program is probably going to be anywhere from five to one levered as high as 14 to one levered. But almost all of that comes from their bond positions. Right. Right. If you strip the bond positions out, all of a sudden they're down to like two to one levered to four to one levered. Um, and then if you stripped out some of the larger notional value contracts, I mean, it's it's very deceptive because it's those bond markets. Because they're lower right? volatility and you have to buy a lot of it to get the its impact in there. Yeah. I mean, like a two-year treasury is essentially cash almost, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it can be, you look at some and say, wow, my God, these guys are seven to one leverage. Well, if, if I remove the cash equivalent style bonds, it's two to one, right? Mm -hmm. So for us right now, uh, I would say that maybe we're three to one if you include everything, right? If you if you said the T-bills are not securities, they're just cash, right? Um, then we're probably down around 1.7 to one. And if you took out the really low vol fixed income trades, we're probably 1.4 to one right now. Yeah, so it's pretty conservative. And your 10% your, your, uh, risk to stop tells you the story. Yeah, I'm not a leverage junkie. I I um I don't seek it out. Um, I, I I'm not sure why so many people do in the industry. Um, there are ways. I just think it's more durable to have a stops that are further away, mm -hmm. uh, and and more broad based diversification and less concentration risk uh, is personally how I like to roll, uh, and that ends up having lower leverage ratios than than a lot of my peers. Yeah, so you're using diversification more than tighter stops, and you know, given how markets move, uh, tighter stops has been getting worse and worse. Actually, I mean, the the parameter sets that were used for trend following when I first got into business were substantially lower than what they are now. Um, uh, of course, that changes throughout time, but over you know, on average, the parameter sets have gotten longer and longer to make uh, make things work out well. So, I'd like to uh, share an observation about that. So I, I don't I don't know anybody who's wasted more of their weekends uh, <laughs> back, back testing parameter set combinations for futures trading strategies. I mean, there was a time <laughs> in my life where I daisy chained computers together and I would start the simulation on Friday night and it still wouldn't be running on Monday morning, right? So what software um, were you using back then? <laughs> oh, back then it was like trading recipes, uh, wealth trade lab, wealth yeah, <laughs> trade trade station, and this was in like the nineties. So like the computers were weak, so I had to like do one one run one process on one computer and then transfer it over and trading recipes i think was one of them eric um, i have to tell you that i have done that <laughs> so we used to have them crazy, and we had the little toggles in the back and we had you know because there was and then you had to program things yourself in order to get things outside the box and yeah. and it was harder to 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 bring things all together as a portfolio much of the, all that out of the box stuff didn't do that. Anyway, I'm getting off track, but anyway, it's just kind of bringing back memories. If you um, don't answer this question, please. <laughs> um, but <laughs> if, if if you know what a domain aggregate function is <laughs> uh, in reference to a, a database, in reference to futures trading, then you're the only other person. Um, <laughs> Yeah, bringing back memories. <laughs> this, this, the contortions that we had to go through in order to do true portfolio testing back in the nineties was torturous, and was. there was nobody to talk to about it. Um, and if you did find someone who was interested in it, they were crazy, and you had to get a restraining order. I mean, it was just <laughs> such a fragmented, messed up industry back then. So you and Tom, I should have crossed paths back then. We didn't. I, it's amazing that we didn't. You know, Tom Basso, I talked to. He didn't remember until after I, I talked to him but i talked to him in like 92 93 something like that uh because we were we he was managing money at you know and i and i talked to we were talking to him like hey we're trying to solve this problem what are you doing and you know what one thing i have to say about tom he's always been the most amazing cordial guy sharing giving even if you're in the industry yeah, hundred percent agree. I, nobody has spent more time uh, and put more thought into his responses to me historically. I applied for a job at his company in the mid '90s, and he sent me like a five-page rejection letter. Uh, but it was all the principles of here's the stuff, here's the pitfalls, this is what you're going to learn, here's what I've learned. All this it was it became kind of the template 
for for my life going forward. Now I wasn't very happy about it when I got the rejection letter, but I kept <laughs> I kept it. Um, and it was it, I found out that you know over time he's right. Every single one of these points is correct about psychology. You know the pitfalls of backtesting and simulations and all the all the lessons that if you learn the hard way take years. So getting back to your your parameter uh, observations, you had. <laughs> I think that was the first thing we were talking about. You said I've wasted. A oh lot yes, of time. sorry. No, that's um, okay. The old like turtle rules, the short term uh, stop loss is too close, whatnot. Um, a lot of people when they hear that that things have had to become longer term and slower in order to survive changing market conditions, people erroneously conclude then that you must always evolve your system going forward to for changing mm. market conditions. They 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 believe that. Uh, what's being left out when people say that is that if you go back in time to the 70s and 80s and you run the same systems that are working today back then, they, they worked, worked well. Yes. They worked very well. So, and that that's essentially what I'm trying to do is run something that I wouldn't have had to have changed from the year I was born, 1972, to current. And if I can do that, if I can do, run the exact same system, and the markets have changed. You've got new markets. Pork bellies are gone. VIX futures are here, so on and so forth. But the risk transfer process and the structural risk premia that you're collecting by providing liquidity to hedgers, that reality hasn't changed, right? And hedgers are still on a calendar year. They still report to a board of directors at frequent intervals. The tax season's the same. You know, the pressures are the same. So if you can put together a parameter set that has reasonably effective results across 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and today, that tells me that's pretty good evidence that there's some sort of a structural risk premium that you're collecting because the markets are very, there were no computers in 72, no computerized trading. Um, but the, <laughs> the system that I'm running could have been run exactly the same way back then. Mm. You didn't even need to be in Chicago like that. Yep. That, that That's important to me. And I'm not claiming yep. to be 100% right in this or that right. other people are doing it wrong. I'm just saying, I'm sharing with you my bias, which this is a bias that I think is accretive to, to, to our firm, mm -hmm. is that I want enduring structural risk premia that are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. I don't want to chase the other stuff because it's here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, you know, Rob Carver, Carver. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that he likes to do is to use continuous signals. So instead of having like discrete systems that are, uh, you know, have a smaller, you know, you have a short term and then an intermediate and long term and then just trade them independently. It's more of like a combined signal strength that's, that's applied to uh, a continuous signal. I found that to be very helpful, actually. Um, um, I don't know if you use that kind of approach. They, they both work, <laughs> you know, whether you do it uh, one way or the other. Um, you know, and in a fund environment, I, it seems to me like in a fund environment, this, the continuous signal can make a lot of sense because you have a target position size that you can apply to your daily NAV. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get too much into the weeds with that. Well, I'll comment. I like Rob's work is great. Mm -hmm. um, he's a very smart guy. And I find myself agreeing with his philosophy in almost all cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't disagree with this one, you know, kind of a, a, a digital continuous signal is absolutely fine. Um, but it's not going to deviate meaningfully from an analog, you know, like 10 systems or whatever, right? No. It's just, you know, it's, it's, but it is more tightly integrated and probably more uh, efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. But you lose something in terms of if you need other people to run it, um, it's very easy for them to get in there and debug something where they're separate systems, right? And then they're oh, that's true. packaged them at, at the end versus when you, I learned that the hard way. I've got good software developers. I am not a good software developer. So they look at the work I do. And after they're done throwing up, they show me how to structure it properly so that it's uh, it can be debugged and you can work backwards and whatnot. So um, I may, I could be mischaracterizing. No, I think you're right that. because, well, yeah, because if you, you, you basically, to get to that continuous signal, you're having, let's say you have uh, three to five on one type of signal. Let's say you're just using a breakout signal. You could have a calculation for a breakout signal that's a continuous, converted to a continuous number, ranging from, let's say, whatever range you want. But then you have to add the other part of it, and then it becomes more of a complicated, it's a big nested formula 
that you're that you're debugging. Whereas in a uh, discrete system, you're debugging, you're limiting what you're debugging to a tiny little area. You're confining. So yeah, and the more complex you get, it makes it harder. But it does, in the end, it does make position sizing a lot easier having that continuous signal. I've converted over to it in the stuff that we're doing on the traditional side. It works very well. So what we do is um, we have three discrete systems. We run them independently. Um, and then the once they're done, it aggregates them all together, nets everything against each other, and gives you one signal. That's perfect. So that way, I think you get the best of both worlds uh, in that you're getting the combined signal. But if you need to go back into the software and say, why is this happening? Each one is run separately mm -hmm. in three different loops, and then they're aggregated together. And then that's what actually gets implemented. And, you know, we could go to five loops or 10 or whatever, but I found those three were 90% of the effectiveness and the rest of it would just be, you know, kind of churning our wheels. Yeah. Um, and the bigger you get, the more discrete makes more sense too, because, uh, or not discrete, uh, continuous, because you're, you're, you, the, the, you know, there's the contract sizes become less and less percentage of the portfolio and your position size is more, you know, day by day could be affected to keep yourself fully invested and get the performance that you need but um well you've been so nice with your time we're we, you know and i really appreciate having you coming on i really love what you're doing i think it makes a whole lot of sense i told tom that um and um you know all the best to you on that and hopefully we can keep in touch and um maybe when i'm in arizona i can come down and say hi to you yeah do that we're in scottsdale uh you're in denver right yeah i'm in denver okay. and it's amazing that we haven't crossed paths since we've been kind of in ancillary areas, but, uh, but probably because I switched over to the traditional side. So I got the CFA and you know, all that stuff was a senior portfolio manager for a bank and all of that. So I've been on the traditional side and all the alternative side. So that's why I say you and I are a little bit simpatico because we've not too, there's not too many of us, by the way, <laughs> as you know, I know, I know it's a lone, it's a lonely uh, discipline. So, but thankfully I'm an introvert. So, um, but yeah, you're down here, come visit us. I got a great team that have assembled. Um, uh, we love our jobs. It's really, this is my dream job. I finally created my own dream job. So I, I, I recommend everyone at least pursue their dream job if they can. Um, cause it's great once you have it. So, but yeah, if you're down here, come visit us and be cool to hang out. And, and your fund has now has a three-year track record standpoint, uh, multi-asset. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got a good re good record compared to all of looking compared to all of the other funds out there that are in the ca in the space. So I highly recommend if people check it out. And um, so, is there anything before we uh, close out? Is there anything that you're working on that you're excited about that you want to share at all? Or well, um, not really. It's uh, we have a saying here that we, we're we're boring. And we like being boring. We're not going to bore you to death, though. Our job is to bore you to success. So uh, there's very little excitement other than just we, we we like our jobs. We like getting up and doing this every day. And you're right. Now that we have a three-year track record and the AUM is over you know, 500 million, we're showing up on people's radar. So we're starting to have a lot of conversations with, with new people. Um, and this is how we talk to clients. We just tell it like it is and say, Hey, if it's not for you, it's not for you, no harm, no foul. But there are people out there that I think are going to look at it and say, why hasn't there been something like this, you know, in the past, you know, why aren't there 10 funds like this? Because this makes a lot of sense. So we're looking forward to those conversations and, uh, just keep grinding away and doing what we do. I see myself doing this for the next 25 years and hopefully making no changes to the program and just, you know, enjoying the, the boring multi-asset ride. That's that's great. So uh, where could we send people to learn more about you or to see what you're up to? Any URLs or anything else you want to share? Or? Yeah, it's it's real easy. Standpointfunds.com. Uh, right there on the front page, scroll down a little bit and put it, your email in there and you'll get our monthly updates. Um, we don't sell your stuff. You know, we're not, we're not spamming the heck out of people. We're just sending you know, some nice content that we've created recently and uh, our monthly updates. And um, we've had very, f most people enjoy our monthly updates. So, and then we also have a um, uh, content section on the website that's got that bond video we talked about, the blind taste test. I don't know if you ever looked at that. That was very interesting to me. It's where I anonymized asset classes and had people build portfolios. And then they would realize they built 50% managed futures, 20% stocks, 10% <laughs> real estate. And it's the opposite of what they do in real life. And so there's a lot of good content on there, I think, that's uh, that's not just interesting, but hopefully somewhat entertaining. Very good. 
Very good. All right, Eric, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Awesome, Lewis. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. The information in this podcast is informational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. WealthNet Investments is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where WealthNet Investments and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. 